Well, Charlie and I have expressed ourselves on derivatives. You know, we don't think the probability in any given year is necessarily very high that derivatives will either lead to or greatly accentuate uh, some financial trauma. But we think it's there. And I think it's, it, it, it's fascinating uh, to look at something like uh, Freddie Mac, where you had an institution that perhaps even hundreds of financial analysts were looking at, certainly many, many dozens of financial analysts were, were looking at. You had an oversight office. Uh, you had a creature that was created by Congress, presumably with committees that would be interested in their activities. You had on the board two of the smartest and highest grade people that you could have in terms of fixed income markets, and Marty Leibowitz and Henry Kaufman, and you had a bunch of other very good directors too. And with an auditor present, they managed to uh, misstate earnings by some $6 billion in a fairly short period of time. Now, all of that wasn't accounted for by derivatives, but but a very large portion, a very large portion of it, six billion. That, you know, that is real money, even well in any place. And uh, a large part of that was facilitated by activities in derivative instruments. Now, you can look at the Freddie Mac annual report for 2000, whatever it is, two or 2001, and you can read the footnotes, and you can read the auditor certificate. And you can look at a bunch of high-class, very smart directors, and you can be comforted by the fact that dozens of people in Wall Street who were paid just to follow relatively few stocks were studying this and that they had conference calls all of the time. And uh, in the end, what happened? It was $6 billion. It probably could have been $12 billion if they'd wanted. Uh, a lot of mischief can happen with derivatives. And as we pointed out, Charlie and I have seen it happen, when there's a derivative transaction particularly a complicated one. The plain vanilla ones, probably people will not get in big trouble on. But when you have a complicated derivative transaction and the trader at investment house A is on one side and a trader on investment house B is on the other side and they record a transaction which has to be a zero-sum game between the two of them and both record, both put on the books a profit that day. Uh, I've, never, I've never seen one where they both put on a loss that day. I, uh, it's it lends itself to mischief, and the scale is absolutely huge and getting larger all the time. And I will tell you that I know the managements of some of the companies that have big derivative activities, and they do not have their minds around what is happening. We didn't have our mind around what was happening at, 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 at Genry Securities. We couldn't. We, we tried to get our mind around it. We couldn't, we couldn't do it. And that was far from, you know, the most extensive or complicated derivative operation around. We had the same experience at Solomon. Uh, but whatever the figures were at Solomon, they would be a great multiple today. And there was a Sunday in 1991 when we were preparing, or we had the lawyers preparing bankruptcy papers at Solomon. And uh, if the Treasury hadn't reversed itself, we would have found a, a judge someplace in Manhattan he probably would have been watching baseball, eating popcorn, and we would have walked up to his door and said, you know, here is a situation with Solomon. There's these 1.2 trillion of derivative contracts that the guy on the other side thinks is good, and they're not going to be any good, and a lot of other things, and, you know, it's your baby. Um, a lot of things correlate in the securities world that people don't expect to correlate, and there are people following similar strategies uh, all over the world has happened when long-term capital had its problems. And the world, the financial world, uh, operates on a hair trigger to some extent. People want to jump the gun and, and, and move just ahead of the other fellow. And when you get huge amounts of transactions, which m many people only vaguely understand, uh, you are creating a, a potential huge problem that may come about because of some other exogenous event that triggers uh, uh, defaults on a, on a huge scale, and that can be very disruptive to financial markets. So we think they're dangerous as used in society. We, we use them ourselves, incidentally. You know, we get them collateralized. We've made money off of them. But uh, uh, 
I would predict that sometime in the next 10 years that you will have some very big problems that will either be caused by or accentuated in a, in a big way by people's activities and derivatives. Charlie? Yeah, I think part of the trouble in, in uh, you were talking about came because people didn't think enough about the consequences of the consequences. That's a common error. You start trying to hedge against interest rate changes, which is a very complicated thing to do when you've got a mortgage portfolio where people have options to pay the mortgages off early. And then, under the accounting conventions, the hedges started making the quarterly results lumpy instead of nice and regular the way all the institutional analysts like them. So then they use another bunch of derivatives to smooth out the returns. Well, now you've morphed into lying. Well, it's complicated enough to start with, but when you add lying to the process, it's a Mad Hatter's Tea Party, and yet this happens with eminent directors of vast financial sophistication sitting on the board. It shows that the sophistication won't save you. Somebody has to have the common sense to say we're just not going there. It's too tough. Charlie was on the audit committee at Solomon and uh, oh. changed it into you know six and seven hour meetings. I think I think you found mismarks that were in the tens of millions of dollars on a single contract with a place with many you know tens of thousands of contracts. Isn't that correct? I think it's fair to say that it was bonkers and that the accountants sold out. Mm -hmm. It's interesting stuff. You might, if you feel in kind of a nasty mood, you might go to the to a shareholders meeting of some very some company that has very large positions in derivatives and grill the CEO a little bit about about some of the more esoteric transactions. It, it, uh, they get they get very very complicated. They they, they get mind boggling in, in terms of trying to figure out the consequences. And the one thing you can be sure of is that the trader that puts them on will will uh, certainly want to mark them at a profit either immediately or within a year or two because he, he gets his bonus too often based on the figures for that year and will be gone in 20 years because some of these are very long dated. We'll be gone uh, when the consequences uh, fall to the firm. I, anytime you have incentives uh, with people who are quite smart uh, to mismark things, you're going to get you're going to get mismarks or, or, or temptations to, to take on risk in, a, in an inappropriate manner. Originally with derivatives, the argument was made that it would disperse risk, that you know, the Coca-Cola company faced foreign exchange risk uh, or, or the, some bank faced you know, interest rate risk. And the theory was that you would use these derivatives to sp spread risk around the system. And indeed, there are many people that make that argument now. I would say that that may work in that manner a great percentage of the time, but the time that counts is when it's when the system has intensified risks and placed enormous credit risks on very, very few institutions. Believe me, the Coca-Cola company is in a better position to accept foreign exchange or interest rate risk in a year than some de derivatives dealer uh, uh, who has tons of positions on. And I think actually there is much more risk in the system because of derivatives than, than uh, the, the, the proponents of derivatives would say has been dispersed because of the activities.